Hello, and welcome to part two in our study on the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. In our intro message, we looked at uh, and re-emphasized the difference between scripture and tradition. So if you've not watched that one, I would, uh, I would ask that you go back and watch that first so that you can see where we're coming from and where our authority is. Let's jump right now into the first one that we're going to look at, and that's the doctrine or the teaching of purgatory. The doctrine or teaching of purgatory. Purgatory comes from the Latin word purgare, I think it is, or let, let me spell it for you because, because I'm not sure I'm saying it right. P-U-R-G-A-R-E. And it means to make clean or to purify. So that's, what, that's the idea behind purgatory. It's to make clean or to purify. The Catholic Encyclopedia defines purgatory as, and I quote, a place or condition of temporal punishment for those who, departing this life in God's grace, are not entirely free from venial faults or have not fully paid the satisfaction due to their transgressions. Did you get that? I mean, understand that because that is monumentally important. It is a place or condition of temporal punishment for those who departing this life in God's grace, but they are not entirely free from venial faults. That comes from the Catholic Church teaching that there's two kinds of sin, or two degrees of sin, venial sins and mortal sins. Completely comes from tradition, has no biblical basis whatsoever, venial or mortal, but we're not going to deal with that here. So they are not entirely free from venial faults or have not fully paid the satisfaction due to their transgressions. So they're saying there's something still due to your sins, your transgressions, and it has not been fully satisfied. So therefore, you need to go to purgatory to be further cleansed, to be further purged from the penalty that is still due to these sins. This idea really became more widespread around 600 or so, and it was through uh, Pope Gregory the Great. He really had all kinds of visions and things that he saw and thought that uh, this is exactly what God was telling him, I guess or that these were truths. According to the Roman Catholic uh, Encyclopedia, Pope Gregory said this about Catholics. Catholics will, quote, will expiate their faults by purgatorial flames, and the pain is more intolerable than anyone can suffer in this life. So here's what's doing. They're going to expiate. They're going to pay for their faults, get rid of their faults by purgatorial flames. And the pain that they experience in purgatory is more intolerable than anyone can suffer in this life. There was another pope who taught that the, that the flames in purgatory are the same type of flames that are in hell. The type of suffering is the same type of suffering that is in hell. The only difference is hell is permanent, purgatory is temporary, but the suffering is the same. Purgatory in, uh, for, at the Council of Florence in 1431, purgatory was pronounced as an infallible dogma. So it's an official dogma of the church. It was later reaffirmed by the Council of Trent in 1564. Session 15, Canon 11, Council of Trent, listen, quote, God does not always remit the whole punishment due to sin together with the guilt. God does not always remit the whole punishment due to sin together with the guilt. God requires satisfaction and will punish sin. The sinner failing to do penance in this life may be punished in another world and so not be cast off eternally from God. <clears throat> Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1030. If you want to look it up, check me out. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Quote, All who died in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification 
so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. So what do we have here? What are they teaching us? And I'm just giving you a couple quotes. There's, there's a lot more. What do we have here? Number one, you're being further punished or purged for your sins when you go to purgatory. God is requiring further satisfaction for your sin from you. Right now, you are imperfectly purified. You need to go to purgatory to be further purified, to be further cleansed from the punishment that is due to your sins. So you must undergo further purification. All of this is so that you can achieve the holiness that is necessary so that you can go to heaven. Now remember what we said in the first lesson, in the intro. Word of God, tradition. They cannot contradict each other. So if you look at these teachings, and you say, well, okay, that might sound a little reasonable. I can see where we need to be cleansed. I can see this. I can see that. How does that compare to the Word of God? That you still need to be further cleansed. That you are not completely cleansed. What are they telling you? They're telling you that although you're saved, you are not completely cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here's where the spin starts coming. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. No. They're saying you're not. If you're saved, if you're trusting in Christ for your salvation, the scriptures teach that the blood of Jesus Christ has covered you. They're saying, no, 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 it's not sufficient. You still need a further cleansing. And that further cleansing doesn't, isn't done by you. It's done in the fires of, or isn't done by God or Jesus Christ. It's done in the fires of purgatory. You must do the further cleansing. It is done by you. You need to suffer. You need to be punished. You need to do things that further purge you because the blood of Christ is not sufficient. Now, if you ask a pope, the, pre, the pope, a priest, of it, is the blood of Christ sufficient? I would assume they're going to tell you yes, but look at what they're saying. Do you see how the one contradicts the other? Listen to the Word of God now. You heard the tradition. Listen to the Word of God. What does God say about this? Exactly what I talked about. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Listen. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It cleanses us. It's the same word for to purify. That's what purgatory is. It's a purifying. It's a cleansing. That's the definition of the word. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses the true believer from all sins and from all unrighteousness. The Roman Catholic Church says, no, nah, that's not it. No. Nah. It's not doing that. You still need to be purged. Now, don't come along with, well, no, these are sins after you committed, and they're venial sins after you committed, after you went to confession. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sins. And that word cleanse there means to make clean, to purify. To clean from the defilement of sin. That's the Greek definition of that word cleanse. Not some sins, not just venial sins, all sin. God says, my blood has cleansed you from all sin. And we, if we continue to sin in the future, which we do, we stumble, we fall, we confess that sin, but that sin and its punishment is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nowhere, nowhere, this aggravates me, because it puts people under such bondage. There is nowhere that the scripture teaches that you need to pay for your sin. Not only it doesn't teach it, it teaches the opposite, that you can't pay for your sin. What are you going to do to pay for your sin? Well, God's punishing me because I'm not... Well, number one, he said you are cleansed. You absolutely are cleansed. 
Well, I have to go and I have to suffer a little bit more. I have to suffer on this earth and I have to suffer in purgatory because of what is being done because of the uh, seriousness of my sin. Really? Who says that? Catholic Church says it. Pope John, Paul believed that. When he got to the end stage of his life and he was going through such things physically, what did he do? He thanked God for those things because he's saying, I'm suffering. And through going through this suffering, I'm earning merits that will get me less time in purgatory. What? Listen to the word of God. Listen to what God says. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He's the just. You and I are the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ suffered on the cross of Calvary for your sins and for my sins. So what is God going to do? He's going to punish Jesus Christ and he's going to punish you? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin and from all unrighteousness, but you still have to do something in purgatory to get that further cleansing. You're going to add to your cleansing. What can you possibly add to the blood of Jesus Christ? Are you kidding me? Think about it. Use your head. Think. Think of what they're telling you. You're going there and experiencing judgment for your venial sins. You're experiencing a judgment and a punishment and a further cleansing for your sins. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my words and believes on him that has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Every true believer in Jesus Christ, every true Christian that has trusted Christ for their salvation. The Bible teaches that the moment you die, you go to be with the Lord. That's what the Bible doesn't teach you go to purgatory. It doesn't teach, we've already seen, you don't need any further cleansing. We're all, all our righteousness, the scripture says, is as filthy rags. What are you going to do? What in the world are you going to do that warrants your punishment to your sin being taken away? The stain of your sin being taken away. If you could earn, if you could merit, if you could work for that type of cleansing, what do we need Christ for? Well, we needed Christ so that we can go and work our way. Really? Completely, totally made up. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches. Grace plus works. Grace plus works. There is no works that you can add to grace to warrant your salvation or to getting into heaven. There is nothing that we can do. Works are simply, you know, and I've had people email me and go, well, works are nothing. You don't think you have to have any works. You don't have to do this. Look at what, look what James said and this and that. Come on, folks. Think. Use your head. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. The scriptures clearly teach, Paul clearly teach, that you are saved by grace. For Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. There's nothing you can do. It is a gift of God, not of works. So what are you saved by? Faith. What does James say? You say that you have faith. I will show you my faith by my works. Is James teaching faith by works? Absolutely not. He's teaching the opposite. He's saying true faith is what saves you. How do you know your faith is true? How do you know your faith is real? How do you know that you have a real, true, honest, saving faith? If you're a true Christian and have that faith, works will follow. You will have the works to back it up. Works, listen to me. Works is evidence that your faith is real. It's not grace plus works. It's all grace. Catholic Church teaches God gives you more grace so that you can work. No, the works are evidence that your faith is real, but the faith is what saves you. Otherwise, you've got a contradiction between what James is saying and what Paul is saying. What else does God say? God says, if it's by grace, it's no longer works. If it's by works, 
it's no longer grace. See, the two contradict, uh, eliminate each other. They contradict each other. They countermand each other. That's what I was going for. If it's grace, it can't be works. And if it's works, it can't be grace because the two are not the same. They contradict each other. It's one or the other. It's either grace or it's works. So James is saying, I'm repeating it again because this needs to be so clear, that the works, we should all have good works by all means. I'm not teaching that we shouldn't have works, that works are meaningless, that works are nothing, but I'm saying the works are evidence that our faith is real and it is a faith in Jesus Christ. And what he did on the cross is that what saves us. That's the point, and that's, that's what's happening here. There is nothing that you can do to add to your cleansing to make you more holy in the eyes of God. God teaches that when you're born again, when you trust that Christ is your Savior, that he imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He takes the very righteousness of Jesus Christ, his Son, and applies it to you. That's a gift. I mean, that is fantastic. That makes us absolutely perfect in the eyes of God because when God sees us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. What are you going to do? What am I going to do to increase on that righteousness? How can I do anything that would increase on the righteousness of Jesus Christ? He's perfect. The Roman Catholic Church says, well... You got to go suffer. You got to go suffer. And you know what? Here's what you can do. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you do some punishment there in purgatory. You can buy your way out. Don't let me get ahead of myself. But look how cheap it starts to get. Do you see the burden that the Catholic Church is putting on you? It's no different than them Pharisees back there with the Jews. They're going directly against the teaching of God to believe that you have to go there and get further cleansed. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 to 8. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, but we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul taught that when you leave this body, boom, you go to be with the Lord. You are with the Lord. He didn't say, we're pleased to be absent from this body, spend a little time in purgatory, or whatever that amount of time is, because nobody knows. And then someday, we're happy to know that someday, someday, who knows when it is, but someday, we're going to go be with Jesus. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The thief on the cross. Think about this. The thief on the cross, Luke 23, 40 through 43. Listen to what the thief said. He's rebuking the other thief that was uh, getting on Jesus. He says, but the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was the thief saying? He's talking to the other guy and saying, hey, what are you getting on him for? He hasn't done anything wrong. You and I, we're sinners. We deserve what we're getting. We're receiving the just reward. So this guy was a sinner. He certainly had venial sins, probably quite a few mortal sins, if you want to get into that. Please. So we know that he's a sinner. What does Jesus Christ say to him? He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged him as Lord. He trusted in him and who he was. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Did he look at him and say, you know, that was a good statement you made there. You're on the right track, pal. You write this, you know, okay. All right, I'll, I'll give you salvation now. Let me tell you what's going to happen from here. You know you're a sinner. You know you're on this cross. You're getting killed for your sins. You're going to have to spend quite a bit of time in purgatory. 
You know, I mean, it's just, I can't tell you right now how long it is. I don't know how, but you're going to spend a little time there. But rest assured, after you get further purged and you get further cleansed and you further pay for your sins, the day's coming when you will be with me in paradise. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Roman Catholic teaching would say, no way, Ray. No way could he be with him today. He's a miserable sinner. Look at him. We're not even sure he'd go to heaven, but if God, by his grace, is going to let him go to heaven, he's absolutely got to go to purgatory. Jesus said today, Philippians 1, 21 and 23, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am in a strait between two things, Paul says, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. I've got to stay here for your sakes, but I'd much rather depart. I'd much rather leave and go and be with Jesus Christ. Scripture teaches that, that when God forgives us of our sins, he doesn't even remember them anymore. He puts them away from himself. Hebrews 10, 17 and 18. I won't read them. Look them up. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. If, Christ, if God isn't remembering our sins anymore, if Jesus Christ has paid for then what are we doing suffering in purgatory? What do we need a further cleansing for? Once again, the blood of Jesus Christ to a Catholic is not sufficient. This is what I argued in the Mass. Jesus Christ offered himself one time. The scripture says he offered himself one time for everyone forever and sat down. Done. Finished. He said on the cross, it's finished. It's done. The Catholic Church says, mm, no, it's not. What do you mean done? It's not done. We have to continually re-offer Christ as a sacrifice in the Mass. And please don't email me telling me it's not a re-offering. Yes, it is. I got three emails last week. One person said it's, it's not a re-offering, it's just a remembrance. And the other one says, how can you just say, to me, how can you just say we're doing this in remembrance? It's an, actually we know it's a re-offering. Even the Catholics haven't got it straight what it is. Read what, the, read what the church says. It is a re-offering. They're taking the same sacrifice and they're re-offering it. It's literally the body. It's literally the blood. They take it and the priest lifts it up and offers it to God. It's a re-offering. One time is not enough. It's got to be done thousands and thousands. Here we look at this and say, the blood of Jesus Christ, it isn't sufficient to purge you from everything. you got to go be further purged yourself. It is a despicable despicable, despicable teaching. It really is. It really, really honestly is. It, is a, it causes every Catholic to fear death. When they think of closing their eyes for the last time, it can be with fear and dread. Instead of knowing, as the scripture teaches, that if they truly trusted Christ as their Savior, that they're going to be immediately in the arms of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that they're going to be welcomed into heaven. No, they got to fear these flames that they're going to be going into. And no one knows how long they're going to be there. Nobody knows. You're going to maybe, you could be there a day, you could be there a week, you could be there a month, you could be there a year, you could be there a hundred years, you could be there a thousand years. Who knows? Nobody knows. Nobody can tell you how long you're going to be there. When we get into indulgences, we'll talk about you can pay to have a mass said for you. Or masses. How many do you have to have said? How many indulgences do you have to buy? How many prayers do you have to offer? How many times do you have to say the rosary before you can get it out? It's, it's a despicable teaching. You can, you can see people that are, are sitting home and their loved ones, their, their father, their mother, their grandmother, their grandfather, their husband, their wife, their children that have gone on and died already, that they have to think of them suffering in the fires of purgatory. And they do, and what is it that I can do? How much can I do to get them out? What can I do to get them out? How much can I pray? How much can I pay? What can I do? We'll talk about that more with, with indulgences, but it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. Plus, think about it. They're suffering being further purged for their sins. Suffering is not the payment for sin. That's nowhere found in Scripture. Suffering is caused by sin. We suffer in this world because we're sinners, but that's not the payment for our sins. 
it's a, it's a cause. It's caused by, our suffering is caused by sin, but it doesn't pay for it. Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. That's the price of sin. You want to pay for your sins? You're going to pay for them with eternal separation from God. That's the only payment that Scripture gives for sins. That's why Jesus Christ had to pay for it. Otherwise, you and I would go to hell. There is no such thing as purgatory. None. And if you think about it, I mean, what, what, what does the Catholic Church teach? That the Pope, that the popes and the priests have the power to get people out of purgatory. They have the keys to, the Pope has the keys to the treasury of merits. We'll talk about that later. That the Pope can grant partial or plenary indulgences that will get you out of purgatory. Think about it. They're teaching you that your loved ones are suffering in the flames of hell. And they have the ability to get them out. But they don't do it. Or they will do it if you pay for a mass. If you buy some indulgences. If you do a good work. Can you imagine? This is why this infuriates me. Can you imagine having the ability to heal that God gives you the gift of healing and you could just touch people. And you go into these hospitals, you go down into the children's hospital and you look at these young children that are suffering with cancer. And you could walk up to them and you could touch them and you could heal them and get that cancer out of their bodies in a, in a second of time. And you go to those parents who are agonizing over their children and you say, I have the ability to heal your child. I'll do it if you pay me. And if you pay me this much, well, I'll do it partially. And if you pay me that much, well, I'll heal them. Or even if you just, if you do this, or if you do that, or if you give this, or if you give that, then I'll do it. You would look at that person as one of the most despicable people walking on the planet. What's the difference? The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Pope has the ability to get people out of purgatory. All of the Popes, since it started, taught that. That they have the ability to do it. Why wouldn't... How could you put your head down on a pillow knowing that there are thousands of people burning in the fires of purgatory? I could get them out, but I don't do it. For whatever the reason. I don't care what the reason is. I don't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I, co I couldn't sleep knowing that I could do that. It's a hideous teaching. It's hideous. It's despicable. Do you see the illogic of it? If you want to sit around and you want to spend your time trying to defend that, let me tell you, don't email me. Don't email me. There is no justification for that kind of teaching. None. Absolutely none. It is a despicable doctrine. What, what do some people come back with? They, they, they use 1 Corinthians 3.15, where it says, If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. That's the teaching of purgatory, if his works are burned up. If you read the scriptures there, read it, read it in context, it's not talking about salvation. It's not talking about punishment for sin. It's talking about rewards or loss of rewards. It's talking about judging a person's work that he has done as a Christian. The good ones, the honest ones, done for the glory of God, they're like the gold and the, and the pearls. And when they're tested by fire, it's a picture of God's going to test them. Were they true good works? Then you're going to be re rewarded for it. If the fire is put to the works... The works that are bad, wood, hay, stubble, they'll be burned up. In other words, you'll suffer loss of rewards. There's no talk about salvation or getting into heaven here at all. It's all based on God judging our works of what was done for the glory of God, what was done for self. What was done for God, God will reward us in his grace and mercy. What isn't will be burned up and they'll be useless and meaningless. It has nothing to do with any type of fire in the purgatory to be further cleansed to go to heaven. Absolutely nothing. If that's all you got. Purgatory, can I say it again? 
Can I say it hard enough? Purgatory is a travesty of the justice of God. It is an insult to the blood of Jesus Christ. It diminishes his work on the cross. God clearly says, I'll repeat it, I said it in the beginning, he clearly says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. All sin. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn our entrance into heaven. There is no suffering or punishment that is yet due. Christ took it for us on the cross. I choose to believe the word of God and to trust in what Christ did for me. How can you justify believing in this despicable, dishonoring doctrine of purgatory? Think it through. You have been put, if you believe in this, you have been put under tremendous bondage. Let me tell you, based on the word of God, your loved ones that have truly trusted Christ are not suffering in the flames of purgatory. They're not. Now, I don't know what anyone believed in their heart, if they're truly saved or not truly saved. But if they are truly saved, they're not in any flames. They're in the blessed arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God teaches. Choose. 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 Word of God or man's tradition. The choice is yours. Thank you for watching. Next video will continue on looking at merits and the treasury of merits. Thank you for watching.